Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and this is part two in my Q&A series. Um, I put a, a question prompt on my Instagram stories, and I got 12 plus questions. And so I'm going to share with you those questions and my answers. Um, I'm going to share them on little minute long reels on my Instagram, but this is an opportunity for me to kind of share more and flesh out the answer a little bit more. So we'll do probably about three questions today. So this is question number four. This person says, how do you resolve a part's unmet needs when you don't know how? Great question. Um, this really indicates that there's a part that is trying to figure out um, how to do the right thing, perhaps. Um, many of us have parts that really just want to get it right. They want to figure it out. Um, and all those parts really need to do is, which is hard for them, but, but is to rest, to not do, <laughs> to relax. Because when those parts that are trying to figure it out relax, the self, the core um, wise and loving adult self will naturally emerge. And it really always knows what's, what to do. It has clarity around that. Um, it knows how to meet needs or to create plan to get the needs met or to get curious to figure out what the needs are and all of that. And there's no timeline or impatience around it. But let me go ahead and um, share with you what my answer to this person was. So I said, likely these are other parts who are trying to think of the answers. So you might ask them if they can relax back and let the creative wisdom come from yourself who's not a part. And then they can come back afterward and think and analyze that potential solution. And I said, I'm also curious about what the specific need that this part is saying it has, because sometimes a part will name a strategy rather than a need. So in nonviolent communication, there's this distinction between the nine universal human needs, um, which I'll try to see if I can list them right now, uh, which are sustenance, like water, food, air, um, safety, security, rest, which includes sleep um, and other relaxing activities. Those are kind of your, your core physical needs. And then um, love, which is being valued, having a deep connection or affection between you and another. So love, understanding, um, both being understood and understanding uh, another, which can include empathy, and belonging, which again is this reciprocity of uh, respect and um, being committed to one another. So those are kind of relational needs. And then the last three are um, uh, purpose, having meaning and purpose and direction in your life. And, the, and then creativity, being able to express yourself and be in flow in some way. And freedom, having autonomy, the freedom of choice is a really core need. Okay, so those are the nine universal human needs. But sometimes... Um, parts of us and other people's parts will get attached to a strategy to meet the need. So they'll say, you have to give me affection. Now you do have a need for love and affection, but the strategy is that that person has to give it to me or you have to give it to me. Um, or I do have a need for security but my strategy is that I have to make X amount of dollars in this certain job or something like that. So um, sometimes our price can get attached to a strategy and we really wanna to get to the need because we can get creative with the strategy to meet the need. Okay, so <laughs> I said also, there may be various parts inside with competing needs and they all need to be heard. This is nonviolent communication on the inside. It's where 
you know, this part has a need for security and this part has a need for freedom. And so this one strategy is you've got to stay in this job that you hate because you need security. And this one's saying, but I hate the job and I want freedom. And so their needs are competing and the self can help values all of their needs and listens to them completely and then comes up with a creative strategy that that can meet both of those needs what's something that we can do that allows us to feel free and have security um so i said sometimes their need just needs to be heard and validated and and they're able to relax and other times they really need a specific plan um like i said a creative solution that meets all the needs and an action plan going forward so the person actually responded to me and said, for example, I would ask a part who eats when it's not hungry, what is the unmet need behind this? And the response I get is, I need love. That makes so much sense to me. Um, and then this person says, but I get stuck because I don't know what that even means. How do I provide that? So again, really to me is evidence that this person is blended with a part. Um, I, I'm noticing, feeling a lot of compassion even for that feeling of, I don't even know what love is. Um, because, so you can see in, in my response, I said, yes, love being valued, shown affection is definitely a core need. And love is who you are at your core that's why it, it shows me that this person is disconnected from their core. Um, so it's definitely something you can give. It's the most valuable thing that we can give our parts. So if you ask any part who blocks you from loving this part, who's eating when you're not hungry, um, if you ask the parts who are blocking, if they can give you space your core self will naturally feel love and compassion and maybe just at first curiosity around why do you do this? What are you afraid would happen if you didn't eat? And they have kind of, um, my, my hunch is that not only does this part that um, binge eats to soothe one who feels unlovable, that that part needs love and appreciation for the hard job that it's doing and it's good intention and the one that it protects also feels unlovable so bringing love into the system for both of those parts is the solution so I think it's wonderful that the parts are giving such a right on answer you know that is what's needed so I said um um if you can offer appreciation for how this part has attempted to soothe the pain of feeling unlovable in the best way they know how through food. And then you might ask if you can go and be with any parts who feel unlovable, your self's loving presence is exactly what they need. Um, yeah. So it's so interesting because binging parts or any kind of addictive parts, they really can't stop doing what they're doing until what they protect is healed. And they really are soothing parts that feel a lot of, you know, uh, distress or um, pain, shame, grief, panic. It's like, oh, here, you know, eat this, it'll soothe you or take this drug or drink that or shop, or work, or exercise, have sex, whatever, you know, do all these things um, to kind of try to placate those parts. But it doesn't last because at the root, what those parts really need, and what this part told this person is love, is um, compassionate presence, a loving gaze. It's okay for you to be as you are. I accept you. I have unconditional positive regard for you. I do not judge you. I delight in you. My eyes light up when I am with you. Um, that kind of thing, that secure attachment is what those parts need. And once they have that inside with the self, then these binging parts, 
and addictive parts can naturally release. They don't need the strategy anymore and they can run and play and do other things. So um, if you have any questions about that, that question and answer, you can leave them in the chat and I will go ahead and share the next question. Okay, so question number five, what do you do when you ask a part why it does what it does and it says, I don't know? Okay, so this is has a little similarity to the last question. Um, this can be this can be common. So you ask a part, uh, you know, why why do you do what you're doing? And it says, I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to share with you what my response to this person was. So I said, you might first check and see if there's a confused, I don't know part who's trying to think up the answer. And um, this can be really common at the beginning that we have these thinking parts that are so used to running the show for us because those are the parts that have been celebrated in our culture and in our upbringing and our, you know, uh, school setting, work setting. So they're used to saying, okay, let me try to think up the answer, but they don't need to do that. Um, so you can see if they're willing to give you space to just receive an answer from the part, even if there's nothing, there's no right, right or wrong answer, even if there's nothing. And ironically, in that space of allowing nothing to be there, you may receive an answer. Um, if the part itself, it, you know, you are receiving an answer from the part and it says, I don't know, that could be true as well. So um, some things that I might ask this part is um, how long have you been doing this job? And again, just wait for an answer without thinking it up. Um, or who taught you to do this job? Because if it doesn't even know why it's doing the job, it's possible that it learned this, you know, it's a, a cultural burden, a legacy burden. Um, it's just the, all, the way it's always been done. I learned it from the modeling of my parents and everyone around me. I don't have no idea why I do it. <laughs> so that's possible. Um, you can ask them for more specifics about what exactly do you do and when do you do it? Like what's the parameters? What's the activator around when you need to do your job? Um, you can ask, do you carry energy that's not yours? For example, from a parent or an ancestor um, because again, if it truly doesn't know, it might be because it hasn't had a personal experience to require this. Uh, it's actually someone else's personal experience and was passed down to them. Um, you can ask, do you have any concerns about stopping? Like the big question, right? For a protector is what are you afraid would happen if you didn't do this job? And again, just wait for an answer to come from the part, even if there's nothing. Uh, because they might say, my parent would think I was disloyal or I would be ostracized from culture, right? So again, it's like it took on this burden out of fear of other people's reaction because this is just what everyone does and I'm supposed to do. And it truly doesn't know why it's doing it, but it's fear is, is judgment. So again, then you can ask, when did that happen? When were you judged? When were you, did you not do the right thing? or do this thing, and you were punished, rejected, abandoned, suffered in some way. And that's then what you would go to to, to help. That's what it protects. Um, and then you can also always propose this hypothetical of if you didn't have to do this, if you truly felt free of it, what would you rather do? Um, to just give them an idea that you're not trying to get rid of them, you're just trying to help them not have to do this extreme job anymore. And if they could, what would they rather do? Uh, so again, you can ask anything of a part that comes from genuine curiosity, right? Um, so those are just some, some common questions that, that might be helpful. But when the part answers you, like it says, you know, how long have you been doing this? ever since I can remember for forever, right? Then say whatever you feel impelled to say, or, you know, you might say, wow, you've been doing this a long time. Are you tired? 
Um, and they might say, yes, I'm exhausted. Or they might say, no, I never get tired. I have to do this. And, and so then that reveals this urgency and you can say, oh, it, if you don't do it, what happens? Like, what are you afraid would happen if you didn't do it? But you can also appreciate them. So you're really trying to protect me. You feel very loyal to do this job and that there are consequences if you don't. I see that. I see your commitment. I appreciate you. Um, appreciation goes a long way <laughs> with protective parts. Um, but yeah, as long as you are in that C word of self of genuine curiosity and openness, you can ask whatever you'd like and, and often just receive an answer. And then those thinking analyzing parts that you asked to give you space so you could receive, you can invite them back in at the end to analyze all the answers that you got from this part. And they love that. <laughs> So that's usually what I'll tell them when I'm asking for space. Hey, if you give me space to just receive, you can come back in and analyze afterward. And once they experience that once, they are like, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Let's do that. Because they get so fascinated by the answers that are given. Okay. Uh, one more question. Let's do one more. So let's go to question number six. This person asks, how do antipsychotics um, or other meds affect parts? Can it be unhelpful to quiet them a lot? This is a great question. Um, I highly recommend Frank Anderson's work on this. He um, has a background in psychiatry and is a, a lead IFS trainer. He, he did work with... Um, Bessel van der Kolk, and he has lots of trainings and workshops around um, medication and IFS and kind of what, what all that looks like. Uh, but I will go ahead and share the answer that I gave to this person. Okay. So I said medication can act as a suppressor to parts. To me, I see medication like a manager um, a lot of times our managers are parts that are, are um, yeah, parts that are trying to suppress exiles or firefighters, right? So they're working really hard to make sure that the panic doesn't come up, the grief, the shame, the terror, um, or to make sure that the firefighter activity doesn't come up, right? That self-harm, suicidality, addictive impulsiveness. Um, so a lot of times the way I see it is that psychiatrists and doctors use medications as a manager to manage those more extreme parts. Um, and sometimes this is needed. Obviously, there are no bad parts. Managers' attempts are not bad. They always have a good intention. They're always trying to protect us in some way. Um, so sometimes there can be a need to create balance in the system when Exiles and firefighters are so extreme that they're threatening harm to you or another person that a manager is elicited, um, in this case, medication to help bring a little bit more balance into the system. But like Dick Schwartz says, polarized parts are a burden system's way of trying to achieve balance. So it's like these exiles and firefighters are so extreme. So we elicit the manager of medication to try to balance it out but it's a very tenuous, um, it's not a long-term solution. And it's not, uh, it's not incorporating the self and getting to the root, right? So sometimes, again, managers and medication can be used, in my opinion, um, and I'm not a professional <laughs> medical doctor, but they, in my experience and myself and with many clients, um, they might bring a balance uh, initially but there needs to be deeper root work to get to the roots to actually unburden the the both the exiles and the firefighters that are acting extreme so that they don't have to do that anymore. And then the person doesn't need medication after that at all. Um, the other piece that Frank Anderson talks about is that parts can actually choose to make medications effective or not. Our parts use our bodies in lots of ways 
to create illnesses, to create pain, to get our attention, to distract us, to punish us, to, um, our bodies are used in lots of ways by our parts. It's really, really helpful to get curious about what they're doing and why. And so our parts can actually choose to make a medication ineffective or effective. Uh, I've definitely seen this in my system personally. So um, Frank Anderson talks about whenever he has a client who's considering medication, that he'll have a parts meeting around it and talk to all the parts because there might be parts that are very skeptical of medication, afraid of the medication, absolutely don't want to take it. Um, other parts who feel desperate and dependent on it, right? There can be polarized parts around the medication itself. So it's really, really helpful to make a self-led decision in even deciding to take the medication or not. And it could even be something like, we'll take it and see what kind of side effects we have. We'll check in and keep checking in. Do we want to keep taking this? Do we not? A part might say, I really want to read all the possible side effects before deciding because uh, it may not feel worth it to my system. The benefit might not feel worth it. And, and so again, it's, uh, but then other parts may say, we're in a total moment of crisis. We're willing to take this risk. Um, we've got to bring emergency balance right now. So, so even meeting with the parts initially around medication, uh, again, giving them, meeting their need for freedom of choice and autonomy around it, informed choice is really important. And then checking in with them all along the way. Um, so that's my two cents <laughs> on that. If you have a different opinion, that's okay. Um, I'd love to hear any comments or questions about uh, these wonderful questions that were submitted if you want to leave them in the comments below.